Uh, we'll talk about our paper, Optimizing Resource Allocation in Hyperscale Data Centers, Scalability, Usability, and Experiences. Let's start with the kind of resource allocation problems we encounter at Meta. So at the lowest level of our infrastructure stack, we have the hardware placement problem. And our data centers are a very dynamic environment. Every few months, we have new racks that are landing in, and then old racks that are being decommissioned. So the problem here is to assign these racks into data center positions so that we optimize the spread of those racks across failure domains. We also want to respect constraints such as power, cooling, and network topology. Moving up the stack, the next problem we encounter is service placement. Here, the goal is to assign uh, servers to services. So typically, ser services request a specific amounts and type of a server, and then we want to map those requirements to, to ensure that we assign the services that the demand that they need, and we respect fault tolerance and allocation stability, and we optimize for their spread. Moving up the stack further, we have the sharding problem, where the services are, have a bunch of shards, and they want to be assigned on a set of geographically distributed servers, right? So we have a set of shards that want to be mapped to these servers, and we want to make sure that the, the resource usage on each server is uh, within the limit, and we want to ensure fault tolerance, stability, and balance load across servers, and honor affinity of, of, of shards towards specific servers. Finally, we have the traffic routing problem, where we have a bunch of traffic objects, and we want to route them to data centers while trying to make sure that we don't exceed the capacity at each individual data center. We want to co-locate related traffic so that the cross data center traffic is minimized, and we want to ensure that the allocation is stable while trying to balance load and minimize latency. So there's one common theme across all these problems. So we are given a bunch of objects and a bunch of bins, and we want to assign these objects to these bins while trying to minimize a certain objective and satisfying a set of constraints. So in the case of service sharding problem, shards are the objects, servers are the bins. And in the case of hardware placement problem, racks are the objects, and DC positions are the bins. So one approach is to design domain-specific solutions to each of these individual problems. But as you can see, it, won't, it is not efficient. So what we need here is a reusable framework to solving assignment problems of this nature. The, there are two requirements to, the, to this to such a framework, it should be easy to use in that it should support wide range of modeling expectations. And, and the second is that it should be able to scale to solve a large number of uh, large problems which have millions of objects and 100k plus bins. So what we have built here is something called Rebalancer. It is designed to solve a wide range of large scale assignment problems. And in the rest of the talk, we'll talk about how uh, Rebalancer addresses the usability and scalability concerns. So first, let's start with usability. So to understand and appreciate the usability gap, let's look at the real example taken from the service placement problem. So this is the mathematical model of the service placement problem. And as you can see, uh, this is very difficult to understand or reason about. So the first uh, highlighted goal is about allocation stability. The second one is about spread across failure domains. And it is easy to see that this model is very hard to write, to, uh, to debug, and to reuse. So what we need here is a much simpler interface that can be uh, hand understood easily by system practitioners. So to that end, we come up with this notion of specs. So you can think of specs as a set of uh, rules that apply on a set of objects and a set of bins across a, some, some real world property of interest. So you can select the set of bins you want to apply the rule on using the scope, and you can set up the set of bins, uh, objects you want to apply the rule on using partition. And you can also select the real world property you want to, apl to apply that rule using. So one common property we want to model is the utilization. So utilization is basically the contribution of uh, objects in the bin towards, towards that bin. So if, if we are thinking about CPU dimension, then it's basically CPU utilization. If it's memory, it's memory utilization. So, one, so these are the three common specs that are used by most of the use cases. Uh, so we have capacity spec that tries to enforce that capacity, uh, CPU utilization or memory utilization of a given bin group it does not exceed its uh, limit. And similarly, if you want to spread objects across bin groups, we want to use the group count spec. If you want to balance load, such as balance memory or balance CPU usage across uh, bin groups, then we'll use the balance spec. These are just a few samples of the specs that we have. We have in total 28 specs, and you can see the paper for more details on them. So here is a rough example of how uh, the specification API is used in practice. 
So for that example, we are focusing on the classical cluster management problem, where we are given a bunch of tasks, and we have a bunch of servers, and we want to map those tasks to servers. So in the Kubernetes world, you can think of tasks as pods, and uh, servers are equivalent to nodes. So there are tasks which are replicas of each other. They are grouped together into the job partition, and then racks con consist of servers that belong to the same rack are, is as a scope of the bin group. So here we want to honor the resource limits on each server. We want to make sure that the allocation is fault tolerant, and we want to, and we want to balance load. And here is how we'll do that using rebalancer specs. So as discussed before, capacity spec can be used to uh, make sure that we do not exceed the capacity limits. And then we can use group count spec to make sure that for, for every job has at most one task on, the, on each rack. Similarly, if you want to balance the, load, the CPU load, we can use balance spec, and we can use the balance spec with storage dimension to balance the storage across servers. So as you can see that just by configuring a few parameters, you can reuse the specs across to model different modeling expectations. Finally, once the specs are specified using the specification API, rebalancer will internally translate this into an expression graph, which is detected in a cyclic. This expression graph can be later used to trans be translated into a MIP model and solve using commercial solvers, or we can use the expression graph to, uh, so to, for our scalable local search algorithm. So the key idea here is that we have decoupled problem representation from a specification and solving. And what that allows us to do is we can add more specs, make changes without actually having to make any changes to the core solving algorithm. So the key takeaway here is uh, the specification API is flexible and offers a high degree of usability. And this has been validated uh, in production by two, 20 plus unique use cases. So next we switch on, switch to scalability, and then I will hand over to my colleague Paul to talk about that. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So traditional representations using assignment variables, such as mixed integer programming models, require you to specify a variable for each pair of object and bin to indicate whether that object belongs to the bin. And at our scale, with 1 million objects and 100,000 bins, uh, that translates to uh, 100 billion variables, so it doesn't work. And while there are techniques to reduce the number of variables here, such as grouping objects that are equivalent and so on, the, these representations are still quadratic in nature, so they don't scale very well. On the other hand, ex uh, Rebalancer's expression graph is explicitly designed to be linear in size. So Rebalancer takes the the user defines specs and translates that into this expression graph, which is a compact mathematical representation of the same. The size of this graph is proportional to the size of the user input. Translating the specs into this graph is a process that's um, highly parallelizable. Um, so in practice, this adds very little overhead to the runtime of Rebalancer. This is what the graph looks like. It's a directed graph without cycles. At the bottom of the graph, we have what we call leaf expressions. These are either constants or expressions that can be directly derived from the assignment. An example is the lookup expression, which evaluates to the utilization of a single bin on a given dimension. And then on top of these nodes, we have other expressions which transform and aggregate the lower expressions. And at the very top, we have what we call the root, which represents the metric we're trying to define. So for example, if the user defines a capacity constraint, what we want to do is we want to make sure that the utilization of each bin is below its limit. So this is an example of how we could compose these lookup expressions to produce a metric that's, um, the value of this metric it has to be non-positive in order for the constraint to be valid. So this expression graph defines the abstraction that our solvers uh, operate, operate on. If we look at typical solvers that are used for the assignment problem, it, they can be categorized into two groups. So one is the exact solvers, such as MIPS. These solvers tend to not scale very well, as we discussed. The second category is custom-built heuristics. The problem with these heuristics is that they tend to be domain specific, uh, so they're not easily reusable across domains. Our solution here is to implement a generic local search algorithm that works with this expression graph. So it's, um, 
it's agnostic to the domain. It can be easily reused. This local search algorithm, what it does is it starts from a given solution, and then it explores a bunch of local changes to the solution, evaluates the solution quality for each change, and then picks the best and updates the solution in that way. And then it repeats doing that until there's a solution that we cannot make more progress from. In order to make local search work in practice for our production scale use cases, um, we implemented a bunch of optimizations that are key here. The first one I'm going to talk about is related to the reducing the vast search space. So one way of going about exploring the search space is one bin at a time. So you pick one bin, explore moving a bunch of objects out of the bin, and then explore another bin, and so on. However, if we iterate over all the bins, that's just too slow. So we implemented this heuristic, which takes the expression graph for the objective, combines that with the current assignment, and then it produces a list of ranked bins by their contribution to the objective. So this way, we can have local search focus on exploring a few hot bins rather than blindly all the bins. Another optimization that's key is being able to make these evaluations extremely fast. And for this, we take advantage of the fact that when we evaluate a new solution, that's typically just a small delta on top of a previous solution that we previously computed. Um, so we are able to, when we are evaluating uh, moving an object to a different bin, we're able to take the expression graph and quickly map which leaves in this graph need to be updated for that move. And then we update those leaves, propagate the changes up to the root, and that's how we are able to evaluate expression graphs that have potentially millions of nodes by recomputing only a few tens of those nodes. Uh, these are just two optimizations and uh, are part of local search. There are more. Um, take a look at the paper if you're interested. <coughs> now, when we use this local search algorithm, we're making a trade-off here. So we're giving up some solution quality in order to speed up the, the solve. This is a reasonable trade-off that we're able to make in production, so solutions are good enough. To test how much the solution quality gets affected by using local search, we took this Kubernetes scheduler problem. In this problem, the main goal is to place as many pods as possible into nodes, and while respecting a bunch of policies, such as um, capacity limits on memory, CPU, balance policies, and so on. In particular, we took two data sets. One is the Azure public data set. Um, for this example, it is impossible to place all the pods in nodes. So the main objective is to place as many of them, of them as possible. We also created a pathological scenario where there is only one solution that's able to bin pack all the pods but that's like a very specific solution. So the results are the following. Um, local search is able to place almost as many pods as the optimal solution. We are less than 2% uh, away from the optimal, but we are five times faster than solving it with a MIP solver. For the pathological example, as expected, local search is not able to place all the objects. Um, but it's able to place 98% of them. And while doing that, it's able to maintain almost perfect uh, utilization of memory. So that concludes local search. Uh, I just want to highlight that the same expression graph abstraction can be used for um, prototyping new solver implementations. So for example, if your model is small enough, you may want to solve it using MIPS. So you can write a solver that takes the same abstraction and recursively translates the expression graph into an equivalent MIP model, and then you can solve it with commercial solvers. So Rebalancer is heavily used in the infra of Meta. Um, almost every single distributed service at Meta is placed with decisions made by Rebalancer. Uh, nowadays, we run Rebalancer 15 million times every day. Um, we support more than 20 different use cases. And all these use cases are implemented using the same set of 28 specs that are highly reusable between these different use cases. And the uh, runtimes are typically, even for the largest problems that we solve with 1 million objects, the runtime is typically under 100 seconds. And this concludes our talk. So we 
cover the introduction to rebalancer and how we tackle the problems of usability and scalability. And we're ready for questions, if there's any questions. Thanks.